I think we could start. So thank you for being here. My name is Mathieu Gros. I am the CEO of uh, Actancy, but uh, we will introduce ourselves later. Firstly, the objective of this presentation is to give you uh, the keys uh, of our methodology that we, we created during the seven last years uh, and dedicated to key accounts. And especially, we, we will answer the question how to keep fun and, and to save money in your own organization. So as, as you can hear, I'm, I have a strong French accent, so that's why Violaine will speak a lot and I will manage the slide. <laughs> but uh, you will hear my, my lovely accent later. OK, Violaine? Thanks. <laughs> Hi, everyone. <clears throat> Well, my voice is a little uh, breaking down, so <laughs> I hope we'll be able to make it till the end. Um, we'll, we'll be first talking about the most common misconceptions that you can find uh, relating um, everything that has to do with project management uh, in general, so cliche uh, that you're used to when you talk about that. Uh, as Mathieu said, then we'll uh, introduce ourselves quickly um, and then we'll enter into the detail of the organization that we found uh, that's proved to be working in our projects for major key accounts, especially. So the focus will be on that kind of a uh, project uh, more specifically. And then we'll go into the planning strategy that we've, uh, we've implemented um, before concluding this session. So um, have fun. Okay, so I start. I wanted to start with this study published uh, three months ago by the Standage Group. And um, we discovered that a, a, a big part of the project are never completed. And this chart shows the real probability of success on IT projects. 52% uh, are completed, but with a big exceed of budget and delay. So finally, only 16% only are correctly achieved, and if we focused on large company, only 9%. So there is a, an issue in our profession, especially for key account management. In my opinion, agencies uh, are too much focused on skills. It's important, but it does not guarantee to provide a better probability. And we have to be aware of the fact that that key account knows this probability, so they need to hear that you are used to manage a strong methodology. That's why we created this presentation. Um, so to start with the uh, misconceptions that you hear most often about, this diagram uh, shows you that a project uh, life cycle is usually divided into two sides. It's a little bit like the world and people. Uh, you've got the optimist side on the one part and the pessimist one then. Um, as we all know, for those who've been working on projects or even for you clients, if there are some of you in there, um, everything kind of starts well when you, when you begin a project, right? Every, People are maybe skeptical at the beginning, but they, they are then eager and more and more eager and enthusiastic to start working on the project. Money is there, everybody's happy, it's great. But then the project takes time. People don't, um, don't see the results immediately. It takes a lot of uh, um, involvement and Sometimes people are actually wondering what they're doing and what they, what they are actually doing it for. Until you reach a point in your project when, uh, <laughs> when you, you, act, you kind of lost track of your timeline. And uh, this is when your organization starts suffering because uh, the solution that most organizations uh, found is usually to ask their people to work days and nights and weekends, eat pizzas in front, of, in front of their computers to actually make it work and make it to the end of their project. That's also actually when you start losing money uh, in general on your projects. But after a lot of work, a lot of hard work, uh, when people have sometimes been fighting and so on, 
uh, you can start seeing the results of your projects. And uh, beer time is not so far away, so people are getting happier. But uh, you're probably only going to have one beer because you're, you're actually broke and you're run short of money. So that's basically what we can notice about um, a lot of projects in general. So we've been wondering how to, uh, to avoid that. And finally, this is our, our probability of success this year. So our goal is to increase your own probability of success. And please note, we continue to tune our methodology since seven years. So it's never finished. And we can continue to discuss about that after, of course. So yes, triple can. We're going to make some kind of promise that's going like, to sound like a big promise to you, but that's actually what we feel like talking and sharing with you today. It's that on a major key account and on any kind of projects in general, uh, with Drupal, you can have fun while working. You can keep on delivering uh, quality within tight deadlines in order, in the end, to avoid bankruptcy because that's kind of what we're all looking for, right? So, how are we going to do that? First, we're going to introduce ourselves quickly. So, at you. Yeah. So, I, as I said, I am the founder and the CEO of Actency. So, I am young, enthusiast on Drupal, and uh, my operational role, op operational role, is to be uh, the project director. So, I am the direct boss of uh, Violain, and that's why this is a good. Uh, Thing that we present together uh -huh. this methodology. Huh? Yeah, sure. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I'm Violaine, <clears throat> and I'm a, what we call a functional project manager. Uh, I'll get back to that later because we make a difference between a technical PM and a functional one, which I am. I'm 28, even younger, and uh, <laughs> uh, I can now say that uh, as a project manager, at least. Uh, Drupal uh, kind of saved my life. <laughs> I've been managing projects for the last uh, seven years now, and more specifically on Drupal so, since uh, two years now. Um, the way to work with Drupal is really different, and, and it makes things easier for the project manager too, so that's what I'm going to show you today. Uh, what's written here kind of sounds uh, uh, important, that I'm a big project specialist. Uh, it's just that I've, uh, I've started seven years ago with uh, pretty much smaller projects than the ones that I'm managing right now, uh, which doesn't mean that they're easier to manage, actually. So uh, don't get wrong on the size of the project. doesn't mean that it's ma it makes it easier or harder, whatever. Um, this is the picture of uh, our organization. Um, it's not, the goal here is not to show you uh, how we're organized or who we are exactly, but uh, you could take your own picture. And uh, it's more to another um, misconception that we have generally when we talk about project management is that we can find the client there uh, with a little precision that a key account for us is uh, in terms of workload. Um, a project that is estimated uh, above 1,000 main days. So it starts to be kind of a, an important project. And uh, in this world, the, our clients, for our clients, internet is easy and it's fast and it's even fun. For, so for them, managing a project is a piece of cake, right? But they always have very short deadlines. They always want things that are impossible and they are very, very demanding. Uh, so the first one to take the pressure on is my uh, N plus one bus right next to me, right? <laughs> uh, what we could have in classic organizations is that normally when the pressure comes from the client, it goes down to the project manager. I'm becoming kind of evil and I'm spreading the pressure through the organization. <laughs> so that's obviously what you don't want. And that's really what we wanted to avoid. So we've been working, um, as Mathieu said, for the last years on a methodology 
to find solutions so that we could avoid the project manager to be the only one taking the pressure and spreading it around to only ha have uh, enemies then. So after these several years, this is kind of what we got. <laughs> A bit of love and magic, right? <laughs> Isn't that wonderful? Uh, more seriously, We've been thinking then um, of an organization first, because you can't set up a, a good methodology uh, without thinking of how to coordinate your people all together. Um, in a Drupal team, uh, you must know, I mean, you probably already know, we identified, and they, they might be even more than that, but we counted as approximately 18 to 20 different profiles that can made up a Drupal team. Um, you probably already heard about a technical project manager, a developer, a back-end, front-end, a Drupal architect, a system administrator, builders, themers, and so on and so forth. How do you choose them? Uh, who are they? Uh, how do you make them work together? And uh, you shouldn't forget that on these kind of projects, in front of these 18 to 20 profiles, you have, most of the time, not only one person. I mean, you find one person who's the project manager on your client side, obviously, but he's surrounded with sometimes 10 to 12 different teams. Uh, you can hear sometimes about business team, hosting team, the security team, uh, the content owners team, the marketing team, and so on and so forth. So remember, 18 to, 18 to 20 different profiles facing 10 to 12 different teams. How do you make these people work together? Who should be speaking with whom? And uh, without it being, uh, becoming a huge mess, right? So that's why, uh, that's why we've been, we started thinking about um, a good governance. How do you synchronize all these people together so that you can reach one goal, which is your timeline, budget, and scope? Because the, the more the people, the more the money, usually, and that's wrong, we're going to prove it to you. Um, you first start with organizing your client's team all together. So it usually starts with a purchasing team, an IT hosting security team on one side, a marketing content owner, business team on the other side, surrounded all by their sales director. There you want to put, of course, the project management um, committee, which is organized with the um, project manager on the client side, who's obviously going to uh, communicate mostly with the SPOC, which is another one of my names. <laughs> uh, I am a single point of contact, but I'm not the only one. Uh, it's just that I'm the the main communication channel through which the client is going to go through if he or she wants to work with uh, the rest of our experts. And of course, this team is surrounded by the uh, project director. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not alone there. Uh, I'm working with the first layer of protection. And I'm using protection, I'm, I'm, I'll get back to that concept uh, later on. Uh, I first work with what we call a commitment manager a CTO, and a CMO, or creative director. Under the CMO, you'll find the information architects, who himself will be coordinating the work of web designers and themers. The information architect is one of the most important profiles uh, that you have in your team. Keep that in mind, and why is that so? Because and maybe, I don't know if you see the color of that arrow there between the technical project manager and the information architect. But these two different profiles, your job as a project manager is going to be to make sure that these two people love each other so much that they feel like talking and working together every single day from the beginning to the end of your project. Uh, this is fundamental if you want to have some success in your project. Um, under the technical project manager, who himself is surrounded by the commitment manager and the CTO, you'll find architects, system administrators, 
lead dev, and the developers, front end, back end, and builders. Don't know whether it's very clear if you're in the back then. So, Excuse me? yeah. Maybe I'm the only one with the commitment managers. Oh, you want me to define the commitment manager? Sorry. A commitment manager is the one who's, uh, who will be planning, basically. Uh, but not only that, is not only a, a planner, um, the technical team. He will be the one who will make sure that the whole technical team is um, committed to, um, to, their different, to the different tasks that they have to do. Uh, I'll get back to the commitment principle after that. But uh, just keep in mind that he is kind of a safeguard, both for the uh, functional project manager that I am and for the technical project manager too. Is that, did that make it clearer a little bit? Yeah. <laughs> um, another way to, to put it, if it's maybe more uh, visual, more understandable, is what we called um, the virtual circle. That's what this governance enabled us to, uh, to set up. As I said before, the most important team is actually there. The, the, the diagram that you saw before is really a governance diagram. It is not a hierarchical diagram, right? So it was more a um, communication channel diagram. Well, obviously, the most important team and people are there. It's, I mean, everybody's important in a team, but without the core team, <laughs> there's no project, right? There's no production. And there I'm talking about the lead devs, architects, developers, themers, and builders. Obviously, you want them to work in a quiet and safe environment. How do you do that? Well, this is why I'm getting back to this concept of layers of protection above them. You've got there this profile that we heard about before. <laughs> Who's the first uh, protection uh, guy? He's the technical project manager. <clears throat> He's the only one communicating directly with the core team. And that's really important because you want to avoid the core team to be disturbed by um, polluting emails, uh, too much communication around the project, and so on. So to help the technical project manager do managing their, its, its team, uh, you've got what we called the shield. <laughs> and the shield is there, uh, is made up of different profiles that we, we just saw before. So you've got the project director here, functional project manager, commitment manager, CTO. The different arrows in between them represent the fact that they are, everybody has a safeguard in a project. Nobody is left alone in the organization, meaning that the project director is there to make sure that the functional project manager uh, doesn't encounter any problems either with the client or with the core team. Uh, the technical project manager is there to send either warning messages or good messages to the commitment manager, to the CTO, uh, when he needs technical help on the strategy, when he needs more resources, he goes to the commitment manager. When he's got a problem with a delivery deadline or whatsoever, he comes to me and we all try to find solutions together. That way, mutual help is promoted within all the members of the team. And that's how you can make sure that you keep around the best environments for fun, of course, but for efficiency, however. This is also an organization that enables me to actually uh, go on holidays from time to time <laughs> without being afraid that uh, I'm going to transform myself into a fireman when I'm coming back. Um, and this really proved to be true because I was away for like three, four weeks this summer and on a very big project, the whole team continued working. Um, it's not that they didn't need my help, but that it's, there are several profiles that took my part then uh, during the summer and uh, it all went well in the end. Once you set up this organization and made it work, you can actually um, add another 
or two or three or four different projects, technical project managers, functional project managers. It's just a diagram that's going to be repeating over and over again, as long as you make sure that this governance that we saw before and that the virtuous circle is working well. So you really need to make sure that people, and that's the basis of everything, that people really do communicate well with each other, that the warning messages really do come and get through the, the from the course, the core team, sorry, through the technical project manager, through the last layer of the shield. As a conclusion um, of this slide, we can say that, yeah, the core team, this is the team that has the power because you trust your experts and you're not going to doubt their workload estimations, their expertise, but it only works if you actually enable them to have this power. So if you empowered them, if they were able to commit themselves to such a deadline, to such a workload estimation, it doesn't work um, with the one without the other. To make it clear, we're going to enter some uh, planning strategy phase. Um, there you can see, we, we divided the project life cycle into seven different steps. So again, uh, we are not there today to teach you any new revolutionary method or whatsoever. Really basically to say that we found solutions that have been working and there might be more steps than, than these seven there, but for us it's really the, the most important phases that you can find. So we go from the purchasing to the implementation inception phase. Uh, functional technical conception and then production and testing strategy until the end. I won't go into the details of the phases that you see, which are the uh, recurring phases on the left. Um, those are weekly meetings and monthly steering committees that you can put in place. Uh, this is not going to be what I'm, well, I'll be talking about today, nor on the uh, right side of the trunk. So. Mathieu will be introducing the first uh, step because it's more his expertise in a project, uh, which is then the purchasing phase. Yes, because I have also the responsibility to sell the big projects to uh, key accounts. So I consider that the purchasing phase is the first step of the project. You give the keys to the project, management, project manager. So I recommend to respect some important points. First phase is to provide a business case to your client. So that's a pre-sales phase. This business case is, is just a document to containing all the main aspects of your organization, reference, methodology, etc. And it's very important to include a TOC. A TOC, total owner cost, is the addition of all the cost of your project on two years hosting, maintenance, license, if you want to compare with another technology. And that's very important. By instance, uh, this year we make the comparison between Oracle and Drupal. And we make the demonstration to a client uh, that he could save until 40% of his budget on two years by choosing Drupal instead of Oracle. So this document uh, is very good for, for Drupal. But after that, there are a POC proof of concept phase, so Drupal has a lot of standard modules, so it's easy to demonstrate uh, the out-of-the-box uh, functionalities, and uh, key accounts love that. But you have, after that, to forecast your provisional budget. And the, there is an issue there. It's not possible to manage all the variables. At this step, you don't know, uh, you don't know a lot of things. You have to organize workshops, but it's not possible. So you have to be optimistic at this step and to write all the constraints in the contract, so in the SOW. And this constraint list is the keys that you provide to your project manager. This is the most important point in this slide. To, to remember. And after that, of course, you have to wait the purchase order. That's a classic scenario. 
but it's important to write in the contract all the constraints, and after that, the project manager can take uh, the, the project. That's what I'm going to do. <laughs> so at this point, as Mathieu just said, uh, you don't have much when you start such a project. As a project manager, you only have three keys to play with. The first one being the forecast budget. Uh, the second one being the list of your client's constraints. And, this is a gift, you've got an implementation architecture. What are you going to do with that and how are you going to play with that? Well, your goal is to identify all the variables that you will be able to work with. And for every single of these variables, define a solution. Um, find all the alternatives that you're going to be able to offer to your client. And in the end, be able to confirm or sometimes, unfortunately, maybe for the client, update the budget. Because I don't know if you, if you really got it, but at this point, after the purchasing phase, it's such a, a huge project that there are lots of things that were impossible to anticipate and to estimate. So the goal there is that you're going to have to enter two validation tunnels. Uh, the first one being the marketing workshops, and there you'll be talking about sitemap, content types, volume of data, anything regarding the marketing side that could have some impact on your planning or on your budget or on your scope. Second uh, validation tunnel is the IT, IT workshops, and there it's just the same. You will be talking with the clients' teams about SSO, LDAP connection, uh, performance, network, third part, um, integration system, a API, and so on. All these topics can have a major impact on both your scope, of course budget then, and um, as a um, matter of fact, planning. Once this is done, this is when you're able to start setting up a good project um, governance and organization by uh, planning the weekly meetings and tools and so on. But um, most specifically, this is exactly the moment when you know how you will have to arbitrate with your client on what's gonna be, um, what will take part of your scope and what will have to be out of your scope. Once this is done and uh, the road is a little bit clearer, you're entering the functional conception phase. The most important thing, and really I'm insisting on this point, is to have the internal kickoff before going to your client. Because this is the first time in the project when you'll be talking directly with your experts, the information architect, the CTO, the technical project manager. These people will be able to tell you um, what you should be negotiating in terms of planning with your clients, uh, what package of development is, is more interesting to launch before another one. Uh, and they will bring points of attention to you uh, that you hadn't seen maybe before. And uh, it's very important. These, all this you're going to be talking about with your client during the client kickoff. And there you start as an iterative. So this is how we work. Um, you give your, uh, the project manager gives the information architect kind of a smart route plan, which is for every single workshop, a detailed scope of what the information architect should be um, working on with his clients. Of course, this is exactly when you should be encouraging both of them, client and information architect, to use full standard Drupal functionalities at the maximum. And then you enter the cycle What's important to notice there is that the workshops um, will enable the information architect to start talking to the technical project manager. So this is when these two actually meet and never leave each other until the end of the project. Uh, this um, cycle here is very efficient in terms of uh, how to detect any scope changes. It allows you um, not to wait till the last minute of the conception phase to notice that the client has been requiring 
a lot of things that were actually not included in the scope. You can detect these requirements after every single workshop because once the, the information architect goes out of a workshop, he talks um, with you and he talks with the technical project man manager, making sure that everything was first included within the scope and is gonna be feasible technically using full standard Drupal um, applications. If not, if something goes, comes out of the scope, then it's early enough for you to go to your client and start arbitrating and say, well, if you want this, it's gonna require maybe either to take something out of your scope or maybe an additional uh, budget and deadline. So yeah, this is what you should keep in mind. Always try to push out of the box modules and remember that actually 90% of a project could be created with standard modules. Going custom is not a necessity always. So as I said before, uh, in parallel of the functional conception strategy, your technical project manager already starts working so that at the same time as your information architect is writing uh, the functional specifications, you've got the technical um, pair uh, who's writing in the technical strategy and technical specifications too. So that when you arrive at the end at the steering committee with your clients, uh, the point of validating all the specifications, you got wireframes ready, design ready, functional and technical specifications done. Keep in mind that at this point, when you validated the specifications on both sides, any single modification implies a negotiation on the scope or on the budget. The advantage with Drupal is that even if you've got some issues because the solution that you imagine first uh, will take too much time or is too, too expensive whatsoever, there are several ways to reach the same goal with Drupal. So it's also up to you to challenge your experts and try to make them find other alternatives and then offer them to your client. Another good thing to keep in mind at this point is that you can have, and it, we really do recommend to get your specifications validated by Acquia. Why should you do that? Well, because you want to get some kind of credit and quality label on your specifications so that you, you will avoid any um, potential judgments uh, from your client once the project reach a, not a crisis point, but some uh, difficult phase. So don't, don't breathe too soon, because I mean, you just got started, right? You might think that you've had an inception phase, a, per, a really detailed, kind of detailed um, purchasing phase, then an inception phase with architects, with uh, technical project managers. We talked about uh, CTOs. I mean, that's a lot of people involved, right? But uh, it's not the end of your problems. Because you're gonna meet <laughs> what's <laughs> what we called um, the project manager biggest enemy. I mean, the first, there are like kind of two biggest enemies to avoid, but uh, please meet the ostrich. Everybody is familiar with what we call the ostrich effect, or not? No? <laughs> well, it's pretty simple. It's like when you bury your, your head into the sand for, for many reasons. There are many reasons for that. What are they actually? Uh, because you're of good will, so you don't want to see the... It's not that you don't want to see the problem, it's that you're not denying that there's a problem, but... Um, you want to do so well that you will make sure that any time, in, in any situation, you, you will manage to, to handle them and to, uh, to fix every problem that you, that you have. Uh, the second reason for the ostrich effect is the fear. As we saw, I mean, the, most organizations, uh, people are afraid of pressure or judgment. So they tend to deny the problems, right? They, they, they hide it under the carpet. Um, 
And third reason for that is uh, actually self-confidence. Because, well, you think about that problem, but you're like, well, yeah, it's, it's fine. I mean, I know, I know how to do, take care of that, and it's, it's okay. It's like a retarding bomb. As a project manager, you're facing the ostrich effect every single day. <laughs> and it comes from every single of your team members. It's not their fault. <laughs> Keep on loving them, but it's a very, <laughs> it's a very, very uh, hard enemy to fight. How do you fight it, actually? Well, first, by trusting the expert. Um, the expert knows better than you. I mean, you are not, as a functional project manager, you're not a Drupal architect, you're not a site builder, you're not an information architect. Um, second, solution for that is to um, never take, it's fine, I'll take care, I'll take care of that, I'll fix this, as an answer, because it's not a good answer. So instead, look for pragmatic answers. How do you do that? Well, just ask pragmatic questions, uh, such as, uh, did you have, did you receive written specifications? Have you read them? Uh, did you list all the tasks that were yours to realize and complete? Did you, have, did you actually estimate the workload for every single of these tasks that you will have to complete? And so on. Once you've got all these answers from the expert, you're like, all right. Well, you said that this task is gonna take you 10 days. I trust you with that. But then do you commit yourself that it's really a, a, a safe workload estimation? And this is when the commitment starts. So I give you the power to say that, and I'm not going to doubt that this task is really going to take you 10 days. But then don't mess up with me <laughs> and, and don't make it 15 days. And commit yourself. So that's the empowerment uh, situation. Um, a fun fact, or maybe not, <laughs> depending, uh, it's that based on our statistics, unfortunately, uh, the ostrich effect uh, actually doubled the budget on two, three projects that we had. It was really a tremendous effect. So, so learn how to identify uh, the ostrich and then kill them all. <laughs> all right. Um, now that you, you know who your enemy is, uh, you can enter safely the production strategy phase. Uh, it's set the same way as the uh, functional conception phase. Uh, this phase will be iterative, right? That's also the solution. So if you know the, the Scrum methodology, it's, it's pretty similar because we will be able, as soon as one functional uh, package is validated, and we've went to the end of it, uh, we'll be able to launch uh, a package of development, the, the matching one, of course. Um, so you want to make sure that your technical project manager first issues a really detailed root plan for every of uh, the developers uh, who are going to be working on, the, on this package of development. You want to be looking for the commitments before starting anything. Don't wait until like half of the developments are done before wondering, well, uh, have I asked them if they were actually sure that the development would take 10 days? Because then you're in danger. So ask for the commitment before starting, but no worries for the developers if there are any in, in the room. I know they are my, my colleagues, but I don't know about you others. <laughs> Uh, you can still cancel, and that's the, the magic of this uh, organization, is that you can still cancel a commitment. I mean, everyone is allowed to make a mistake, to get wrong with a, an estimation. It's, it's really a hard task to estimate a workload precisely. But the only golden rule there to remember is that cancel your commitment halfway. Don't wait for the sake of... Uh, the, the project manager, don't wait for it until the, the end, like the last minute to cancel your commitment because then it provokes a huge crisis, obviously. Uh, don't wait for the day before the delivery to say that you're not gonna be able to make it. A good thing to remember is uh, 
that this is the time, this is the exact time when you should be creating your test plans because you, you will have to kind of educate your client to the idea that the test plans will be replacing at these steps the specifications that you validated. Because test plans, they are those scenarios that will enable your client and yourself to check and make sure that everything that was validated, uh, that was validated before was implemented and works well. So the test plans at this point really become your referential and they replace the specifications. Keep that in mind for the, the end of the cycle. <clears throat> but don't you run away too fast because you are not done yet, almost. It's long. <laughs> Project's life cycle takes long. Uh, you're entering the testing strategy phase. There are two sub-phases uh, in the testing strategy phase. There are first, the internal strategy, uh, the internal testing, sorry, and then the external testing. Obviously, you won't be delivering uh, a project that hasn't been tested and validated before uh, to your client. This is when your second uh, biggest enemy as a project manager and as a whole team uh, comes up. Uh, and they are the regressions. It's very important to not deny them because they exist and you have to work with them. So this cycle is pretty simple. Uh, you created the test plans before, so now you're going to execute all the tests. Um, and then the functional project manager, which I am, will be qualifying every of these tickets. First by giving them priorities and maybe identifying some tickets as evolutions uh, or as real bugs to correct. The technical project manager then will be estimating the workload for every single ticket that was created, which is very important because then, of course, the core team will be resolving and testing again um, the, the tickets, but this, the workload estimation is very important for your technical project manager to be able to issue every day a report, for which we'll, we'll see an example of it later on. But this report will tell you exactly um, how many tickets were created, the workload that was estimated to treat all of these tickets all together. And this is when the technical project manager will be asking the commitment manager and the functional project manager to add more people because the workload estimation was actually too important. Or, it doesn't happen so often, unfortunately, but you can ask to, for the bandwidth, what we call the bandwidth, how many people can treat um, how much workload uh, to be reduced. So it becomes then the, uh, it's in the hands of the commitment manager then to uh, either reinforce the bandwidth or uh, reduce it. Reducing it is, uh, is not always easy for him, but it's actually a little easier still than reinforcing it. <laughs> because uh, when you arrive from one day to another to your commitment manager with a kind of a crisis situation requiring 15 more people from uh, the evening and you want them in the morning, then, <laughs> then you're, you're pretty sure he's going to spend a good night. But it's not your problem anymore. <laughs> it's his. Uh, that's also um, what you realize that uh, thanks to Drupal, it makes it easy to involve big teams from one day to another. Because the only problem that the commitment manager uh, has to fix then is to find the people. But apart from that, you can really add, and I'm not kidding, that's what we've been doing uh, sometimes, it happened, uh, that we needed from one day, from one week to another, uh, a bunch of 10 more guys uh, to respect our deadlines, but yeah, be able to treat all the workload. Uh, he was able to do that, so <laughs> it's good for him. But that's when you realize that with a good qualification on your tickets, then you can involve uh, builders, themers, uh, Drupal architects on more complex architectures and so on. 
and have them all work together uh, without disturbing the, the global project. <clears throat> So this is an example of the report uh, <laughs> that uh, our technical project managers can, uh, can give us every day. As soon as you start uh, entering the testing phase, this is what you want to require uh, from your team, from your technical project manager. This is the only way that you can control what's going on and that you can make sure that you will be delivering a project on time. Why is that? Because I don't know if you see that well, but in the first column there, you have the bandwidth, all right? So that's pretty much how many people, oh. <laughs> how many people were planned so far. Uh, so as an example, I took the date of uh, the 17th of September on a project that we, we were testing. We had 14 hours that were planned, right? So it's two man days. We had two people um, available by then. Uh, we had a number of 22 tickets left to, to complete, sorry. Uh, the workload was estimated by the technical project manager to 25 hours, so in other terms, we couldn't make it. When this happened, the technical project manager, the commitment manager and I, uh, we met, <laughs> had a nice chat, and uh, I... <laughs> I asked the uh, commitment manager to provide uh, double the time that was actually estimated, and that's our recommendation. Because when you have 25 hours estimated on tickets that are already created, don't forget about your second biggest enemy, which are regressions. You want to make sure that you'll have enough time to treat them all. So you want to then, for this example, you'll be planning 50 hours, right? So he had another quiet evening then <laughs> when I asked him to find so many people from one day to another because we hadn't planned that the, the project would, would extend further than the 20th of September. So it was a piece of cake. <laughs> uh, once this is done, I mean, you're almost done. But uh, now you're going to deliver the project finally to your clients. And that's a dangerous road. Um, I'm not going to go into details through the, uh, the cycle again, because that's what we've uh, just uh, uh, talked about. But I want to point out the, the, two, um, the, the, the two things that I've added um, above and below the, the cycle diagram. Uh, as soon as you enter the external testing phase, you should be sending your client a validation report. This is the little paper, magic paper, that you want to get at the end of your project saying, well, all right, good job, you're done, you're, the project's on, I'm the client, and I'm signing it. How do you do that? Well, if you send it to your client in the middle of the testing phase, which is a time when the pressure can be pretty, pretty intense on both sides, uh, it's really not likely that you're gonna, you're gonna get it easily. But if you, if you send it to your client at the beginning of the testing phase, it prepares him psychologically to the fact that at some point it's gonna end and he's gonna have to send you a report and that it's still gonna be possible for him to list all the things that are still to be corrected even if he signs up the paper and because he has a deadline and, and the project has to go online in the end, uh, it, you can reassure him and say, well, at this point, we won't leave you alone after the project is online. You can still list then all the things that you want to have corrected and that's fine. It's also very important because this validation report will put, um, will put your client in a position when he also has to get into such a commitment, right? It's a win-win situation. You're not the only one to be working hard and uh, wanting to, this project to work in the end. Uh, your client has a responsibility in doing so. The first one is to promise you that he's gonna execute his tests by respecting two things, the validated specifications on one side and the test plans, right? This is how you can make sure that you can keep being efficient during the testing phase and that you're not going to be debating over problems that 
are not even problems because it was not written in your specification. So this is kind of the rule to respect. And second is that it's going to put him in a position that he will know that from the moment when he signs on the paper, any new ticket that hadn't been created before, so any problem that hasn't been identified before that, will become an evolution. So there won't be any correction, and that way you can make sure that the project has a real end. So at last, but not least, um, if there are three things that you can keep in mind for your project, um, three things that you want to guarantee on your project is the production speed. How do you guarantee that? Well, thanks to your technical project manager working together with the, the, the CTO on the technical strategy. So you want to make sure these two people work together. Uh, budget and scope, thanks to the project manager and project director, there are the safeguards on this part. And the bandwidth, which is the commitment manager's um, job, problem, <laughs> knife. So it's thanks to these profiles, the different layers of protection that we've been talking about before, that you can ensure that your team will work in a safe and quiet environment. Uh, they won't be polluted by external communication that they don't have to deal with. Um, yeah, and that you meet uh, your objectives and, and deadline on time. Okay, there are a lot, uh, a lot to, to say on the methodology, so we have to, to end. Uh, <laughs> Uh, it took us uh, seven years to come up with this methodology, but it's still continuously improving. So it's good to know that it increased by five our success rate since the beginning. And it took three years to reach this goal, become cost efficient, because it was not the case at the beginning, clearly. We are cost efficient since uh, four years, thanks to that. and. Uh, to be able to manage the crisis and, and to keep a fun atmosphere. That's maybe the most complicated goal uh, to, to reach. So I hope you can pick something for your own methodology. It's done. We explained uh, a lot of things. And uh, I hope uh, it could be uh, helpful for you. And thank you for your patience. Uh, now, if you've got some questions, I think we still have time. I don't know what time it is, actually, but we might still have. Uh, yeah. I do have one. First of all, I hope the commitment manager had time to come here. He's right behind you, actually, so. Respect to you, man. Yeah, give him uh, a big applause. <laughs> no, actually, um, thanks for the insights, very valuable. Um, one thing I wanted to know, if you hear around here on the floor, everybody's talking about Agile and Scrum and all of these more iterative approaches, whereas you clearly are in a waterfall approach. Is that a, a particular choice you made? I'm not sure I got it. Uh, so that we didn't go 100% Scrum, or? Why, why didn't we go there? What are the reasons that you don't adopt a, a Scrum? A Scrum approach? methodology, that's a good question, actually. Um, because we noticed that major key accounts, our clients are not, are not really ready. I mean, that's the reality. We understand the benefits of the Scrum methodology, but our clients it's, it's still hard um, on, on such major key account projects, like more than uh, 1,000 main days. Uh, they, the most recent example um, came up like three weeks ago. Uh, it took us two, three months to actually get what Matthew called the PO, the purchase order, because we were, on a, we were talking about a forecast budget, a forecast planning, 
so there was not anything was not fixed or so in that way it's pretty similar to the scrum methodology but as long as they could not have the written and fixed promise that we would keep uh, this budget that we would uh, keep this planning that it wouldn't have uh, they wouldn't have let us start with the project and it's hard for them to uh, it's still hard for them to to um, to be convinced that the Scrum methodology is actually a good one. So you have to commit somehow to the fact that there's going to be an end and that you can communicate already at the beginning of the project on a, an end date. This is basically why. But the iterative uh, cycles that you, we actually go through gives our clients the feeling of agility. It gives us a, a feeling of agility too. I mean, it, and it's important because our teams uh, don't work in a tunnel, uh, in a tunnel, right? They don't have the, uh, the feeling that they start and that it's never ending until like a year later. Uh, it gives us the, the, the possibility to, to really see the results pretty fast, right? So that's the, I hope it was a little bit clearer. If not, we are <laughs> we are still at uh, booth 35, by the way. But any other questions? No. Well, if you happen to have any, um, we are in uh, booth 35. Uh, we'll be having some um, uh, some cocktail hour uh, tonight at six, if you want. Uh, I'll be happy, and, and we'll be there till the end of the week, basically, so I'll be happy to uh, share this uh, little insight with you. Thank you. <laughs>